If you were here last week, I said that this letter of 1 Peter, it was meant to encourage and challenge us in our faith. And I asked you this simple question currently, like, where are you in your faith? Remember, I, I, I started to break it up in three categories. Uh, is, your, is your faith flat, stale? Secondly, is, would you call your faith sort of slipping? It's no longer a priority in your life. Or three, is it completely derailed, non-existent? And I want to expound on something else that I said last week concerning those that were receiving this letter from Peter. Primarily these folks were Christian Gentiles. So, so they were folks from, now get this, pagan cultures from this area that either currently had no belief system whatsoever or had been worshiping false gods and idols. In the past, these same folks, they might have even heard of this God of the Jews and some of the amazing things that, that he supposedly had done throughout history, but they had absolutely no access to this God whatsoever. Anybody, you know, through your work or whatever, have one of these magnetic key cards, you know what I mean, that, that allows you access into a building? You know, you wave it over the lock, and if your card, if it's been coded to allow you access, then you hear that clunking sound of the, of the magnet being unlocked and the door being released. Now, now, if your card has not been coded for access, you can wave that thing, you can press it up against it, you can do all you want, and you're not getting in. Prior to Jesus, Gentiles had no access to God. Period. So with that in mind, listen to the words of 1 Peter written to these early Christian Gentiles, followers of Christ. In, in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 4, as you come to him, a living stone, this is Jesus they're talking about, rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious. You yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in the scripture, behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious. Now here's what this has been so encouraging to them. And whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So the honor is for you who believe, but... For those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. A quick summary of that text is this. Jesus is the living stone. Jesus is human rejection, his death on the cross, and then his divine election his resurrection from the grave, opportunity, it gives an opportunity for all to put their faith in him. Jesus now becomes a choice for all to make. See, see you got to get this. Up until now, only the Jews had access to God. They had the bloodline code that opened the door. But now, everyone's access key has been reset. Now everyone, all, have equal access. And the code to the key is simply a matter of faith. God, the locksmith, has changed the lock. See, today, if, if you're a believer in Jesus, what are you referred to as? It's not, not a trick question. You're referred to like as a Christian, right? Yeah. What does it mean to be a Christian? See, I believe if I were to ask 100 different people to define what it means to be a Christian, I think I might get 100 different nuances. Some people believe that being a Christian is all about what you believe, right? Some people believe being a Christian is about your behavior. Christians do and don't do certain things, right? Some people will say that, that being a Christian is about your brand of Christianity, what kind of church you go to, Presbyterian, Catholic, Pentecostal, non-denominational. Some will say that they were raised Christian, 
Meaning I was, I was sort of always a Christian. Others will say, I used to be a Christian. Some will define it by what they're not. They'll say, well, I'm not one of those intolerant conservative Christians, or I'm not one of those liberal anything goes Christians. See, I believe in, uh, that American culture, in American culture, we can hide behind the word Christian and, and make it work for us, depending on whatever situation or environment we are in. Are you aware that, that the word Christian is only used three times in the Bible? In Acts 11, verse 26, it says this, and in Antioch, the disciples were first called Christians. In Acts 26, 28, is, the, is Paul, and he's challenging King Agrippa to consider Christ. And the king responds, in a short time, would you persuade me to be a Christian? And then in 1 Peter 4, 16, we're going to get to this in a few weeks. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. That's it. And in all three of these times, the name can be almost translated as, as outsider. Oh, oh the, the Christian, they're part of that Christ crowd. And in all three times, the word is said with reproach, meaning it has a sense of like scoffing or ridiculing. However, Jesus, what did he call those that followed him? He called them his disciples, and that word has much more clarity. It means a learner, a follower. Do you remember the story in the gospel where Jesus is walking along with his disciples and he says, hey, what are the crowds saying about me? Who, who do they say that I am? And they give these responses, and then he turns to his disciples and says, yeah, but who do you say I am? And if you're familiar with that story, Peter, right? He goes, you're the Christ. You're, you're the son of God. Well, this next verse in the scripture that I just read, I'm going to pick up right in verse 9. It's Peter, and he's telling the receivers of this letter, and basically he's telling you who Jesus says you are. Now remember the audience Christian Gentiles. As a disciple, as a follower, this is who you are. It starts by saying, you are a chosen race. Translated, it means elect or a chosen line. It was about a nation, Israel. Now it's about your faith. Not your bloodline that makes you chosen. You are an elect race. As these Christian Gentiles, formerly that had no access do you see how encouraging that would have been to them to be called that? They had no chance of that in the past. Second, it goes on to say, you are a royal priesthood. This literally translates to royal residence. Folks, you're a household of the Spirit of God that resides in you. That's who you are. Third, it goes on to say, a holy nation. This means basically a, a holy community. Israel, it was the holy nation set apart by God, but now the church, this holy community formed by faith, not by biological birthright. That's who you are. And lastly, it says a people for his own possession. This language goes all the way back to Abraham when God made a covenant that he would call all people. You are his own he shed blood for a new promise to call you his own. And the verse cl closes with, now that you know who you are, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness and into marvelous light. That would have come as such a wave of encouragement to these folks. They would have read that and said, oh, I mean, though we may be suffering, and though the culture around us is telling us that what we believe is foolish, we are set apart. I mean, we're chosen. We're royal. Have you ever taken your child aside and just heaped praise on them for who they are, right? Just for being your son or your daughter, 
right? Not for something they did. Not, oh, you're such a good boy or a good little girl for what you did for this or that. No. J just heaping praise on them and saying, I just love you. J just absolutely the way you are. I couldn't be more happier to have you as my son or daughter. That's what they would have heard in this letter. But they would have also known the responsibility that came with being called a community. They would have known that they were to love one another well. They would have read this and, and known that it, that it comes with reaching out and helping those in need, with making disciples, with continuing to learn and proclaim the excellencies of the one we follow. See, I believe it is possible to do the Christian thing alone, without community. Why? Because I believe you can make the word Christian mean whatever maybe you want it to mean. But I believe you cannot be a disciple or call yourself a follower of Christ and do it on your own. Being a believer on their own would have been absurd to the people receiving this letter. And I really think it's just about as absurd today. I want to spend just a moment saying why I believe being part of and being committed to a local church is crucial to being a Christ follower. And those of you that know me well know I love the local church. And you know I've beaten this drum before. And some of you might be thinking, well, of course it's important to him. He needs his attendance numbers to be trending up, right? See, see, please hear me. What did I say? I said, be committed to a local church. And if it's not this one, if this one's not a good fit, then find one that is. And I really mean that. I want to share a scripture and a couple thoughts with you about being part of the local church. And this is coming straight from my heart. So please hear me on this. Some of it might be quite challenging to some of you. It's Hebrews 13. Verse 17, the first little section is aimed at those that attend church. It's aimed at the churchgoers. It's aimed at you, and it opens with this line, Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls. P people don't commit to churches based on that verse anymore, right? People typically join churches because they like the music or they like the kids' ministry, you know, or that guy makes me laugh. And the Bible makes it clear that when you commit to a church, you are agreeing to submit to the authority and to obey the, the leadership. Now, obviously, if the leadership has stepped out from under God's covering and authority and is off doing, well, no, th that, that's not what we're talking about here. But submitting and obeying, it just rubs against our human nature, doesn't it? Come on, be honest. We don't like those words. Those words just cause us sometimes to even just get our back up right away. Really? Th that's our, often our, our reaction to, to being told that we need to submit and obey. It's part of our nature. This is basically saying when the pastor preaches the word of God, I'm supposed to listen. When he weighs in on life and on wisdom, I'm going to obey. And I don't think most people think like that. I think often the prevailing thought is today, if he preaches something that gets into my business or rubs me the wrong way, I'm going to find a church that doesn't. Or I'm just going to stop going to church. See, the first phrase in that verse was aimed at churchgoers, and then there's a comma. And what comes after the comma is aimed at pastors and elders and leaders of the church. It says, as those who will have to give an account... Folks, I will be accountable as to how I tend to and watch over your souls. I will stand before God, according to this text, and have to give a specific account of how well I did my job. How did I shepherd you? How well did I listen? How did I pray for you? How did I care? How did I challenge? How did I encourage? How did I lead you? This is overwhelming to me, to be honest, and it should be to most church leaders. Do, do you know what one of my pastor daydreams is sometimes? I drift back. 
to my first ministry job in Homestead, you know, where I started by leading seven or eight kids that showed up to my first youth group meeting. I knew where they were with the Lord. I knew if they were not there. I knew what, you know, was deep inside them, what, what was causing them pain. And, and frankly, I, I felt like I had a better shot at standing before God and giving an account of tending to those seven or eight souls. But instead, God has called me here. About 5,000 people calling Northway home. And I will stand before God and have to give an account as to how I stirred your affections for his son, Jesus. And God says that I'm going to be held accountable for that. And that's terrifying. The verse closes with sort of back to you. It says, let them do this with joy and not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. Basically, it's saying here, it's, it's no advantage of to you to, to you to beat your pastor down so they hate their job. It's no advantage to you for your pastor to have a long list of congregation members that he would like to see God take home by the end of the month, right? It's no advantage of that to you. Let me say this, 11 years here, a year and a half as your lead pastor, and I consider it a delight, man, and a joy to be your pastor. It is a pleasure for me to serve God by serving you here at Northway. But hear me on this. Man, I'm serious about church membership, about committing to a local church. If you are opposed to this church's vision and leadership, find a church that you align with and commit there. Peter, in this letter, is clearly addressing Jesus' followers, doing life together in community. Not individual Christians trying to do it on their own. Two, two points I want to make about this. First, I have heard some people say, and I'm sure that you have along the, the way, you know, church or Christians, in general, they're nothing but a bunch of hypocrites. You know, they, they talk one way and act another. Have you heard this? Can I try to flip your way of thinking? Tra track with me here for a moment. When you come across an immature believer in this church, someone that claims to be a believer in Jesus, but you can see hypocrisy in their lives, folks, that should not be a repellent to you coming to church. It actually should be an encouragement for you to attending. Why do I say this? Hey, absolutely, there are immature, hypocritical believers here, and God is being patient with them as they move from crawling to walking to following. Should that not be an invitation for you to come and do so also? F folks, would you feel welcome in a church where everybody had it all together and was following Christ perfectly? You wouldn't. So praise God for those hypocrites like you and like me that don't have it all together and jump in with us. S secondly, I have heard people say, you know, I'm, I'm cool with Jesus. I just don't want anything to do with the church. D do you know what Jesus called the church? He, he called it his bride. So, so you know what that would be like? That would be like you coming to me and saying, Scott, you know, you and I, we're cool. But your wife, horrible woman. Now, not sure why you ever married her. She disgusts me, right? You and me, Scott, like we can hang out, but don't be bringing that stanky wife of yours around. We're going to have a problem, right? I think Jesus has a problem when you say that. that that's his bride. And folks, wherever you want to enter into believing in God, you must know this, that from the beginning, God's people gather. God consistently throughout the entire narrative of the Bible commands his people to get together. 
whether it was Mount Sinai or the upper room, whether it was in a temple or in homes, we are a people that gather. It is supposed to be in our gospel DNA to get together. Just want to issue a challenge across all campuses. Next weekend, we have our You Belong conversation or class, opportunity to join the church. If you've been around, been around Northway for a while, would you consider going if you're brand new, would you consider going and just hearing sort of our history and our vision? Membership is important. Folks, I believe this is crucial for us as adults. But as your pastor and someone that did kids and student ministries for over 15 years, I believe it is imperative for our kids and for our teenagers. You know, some staff members and volunteers from our kids and student ministries across all of our campuses recently went to a children and youth ministry conference in Atlanta. And our teams came back and they were excited and they were affirmed about the great foundation and vision of ministry that we have here. I am so proud of our kids and student ministries here and across all campuses, all of our leaders, all of our volunteers. At a recent staff meeting here, Amanda Beggs, who oversees the kids in the middle school and the high school ministries here at the Wexford campus, shared with the entire staff the Family Matters vision across Northway and also gave some clarity to it that they gained at the conference in Atlanta. And I sat there listening and I thought, oh my goodness, our, whole, our, church, our church needs to hear this. They, they need to understand this. And I thought, instead of me trying to get up here and said what she said and certainly messing it up, um, I asked Amanda if she would share this vision with you so across all campuses, will you give her a welcome to us today? Thanks. Well, hello, everyone. Can I ask you a question? How many weeks do you think a child has from the time that they're born to the time that they graduate from high school? Don't cheat and look in your notes, because I know it's on the back side. On average, a child has 936 weeks from the time that they're born to the time that they graduate high school. 936, that's all. And if you look back here, we have this jar of marbles. And this jar right here is a physical representation of the life of a child. There's 936 marbles in there. And if you were to take a marble out for every week of their life, that number would get smaller and smaller. So the next jar you see there, if a child is in first grade, you're already down to 572 weeks. If you fast forward a couple years to sixth grade, you're down to 312 weeks. And that last jar down there, a few more years down the line in 10th grade, you only have 104 weeks left with your child. You know, at this conference that Scott was talking about, they did this whole demonstration for us, and we were like, wow, that is a super depressing way to start a conference. And then I was kind of thinking, well, thanks, Pastor Scott. You bring out Miss Amanda on Mother's Day to talk to moms about how much time they don't have left with their kids. Awesome plan. <laughs> but I hope that by the time we're done, you realize that we're not saying this to depress you or to make you feel guilty, but to remind you of how much you matter. You're making an imprint, a permanent imprint on the soul of a child. You're leaving a legacy. And while you're losing your marbles, whether it's figuratively or for a lot of us, literally, you're playing for keeps. And if you've been around Northway for any period of time, you've probably heard us say the phrase, partnering with parents. And the vision of Family Matters is to partner with parents to raise a generation who knows Christ. And the essence of that vision is really community. It's the family and the church coming together. It's one generation making disciples of another. And I know we throw out this phrase, partnering with parents, and we say focusing families on what matters. But today, I want to clarify for us what matters and why it matters. So to do that, I'm going to put that Family Matters vision against the backdrop of six things that every child needs. Time, love, words, stories, tribes, and fun. We're just going to do a real high-level overview of that. But before I do, there might be some of us out there thinking, you know, I don't have kids yet, or I'm not really an official leader of any kind. But I don't want you to tune out, because I think you could really get something out of this. Because I'm willing to bet that most of us are impacting at least one child or one student in some capacity. And if you're not right now, 
You probably will in the future. So as I'm kind of talking, maybe get a picture in your mind of a child that these six things might apply to and how you can apply them in their life. So we're going to look at these six things, not just in an instance, but over a period of time. So the first one is time itself. And when we give kids time, over a period of time, we give them history. And when we realize how much time we have left, when we see those marbles, we make the time we have now matter more. And as parents and in leaders, it's really important that we leverage every week to create a history. And we do that by making memories and creating rhythms where God is at the center of our daily lives and by making every marble in those jars matter. The second thing that every child needs is love. And when we give kids love over a period of time, we give them worth. And kids in this generation need adults to stand up and to show up and show them what God is like. When we start with the beginning, when we start with the story of creation, where we were created in God's image, that story, it says you're worth something. When we look at the story of the cross, it says you're worth something. And so does everything in between. When we show kids who God is like, when we give them love over time, we give them worth. You know, I work with so many kids and students who've made some really poor choices. And it's because deep down, they feel absolutely worthless. And it breaks my heart. And that's why we need to love them well over time. So we have time, love. The third thing is words. And when we give kids words over time, we give them direction. And words are small things, right? But we all know they have a big impact. They give us direction. And every time we speak, we're reinforcing or expanding their vocabulary. Words shape the way we see things. They shape the same way that we see the world. They shape the way we see ourselves. And they shape the way we see God. Words are important. The fourth thing is stories. And when we give kids stories over time, we give them perspective. Stories over time remind us that there's a world bigger than ourselves. And kids need to know that that bigger story, that they're a part of it, and that God is the author. Jesus told stories, right? He excited our imaginations and invited us into the action. And as parents and leaders, we'd be wise to do the same. And the fifth thing that every child needs are tribes. And tribes over time give kids belonging. And what I mean by the word tribe is really just a like-minded community. And belonging is what makes our faith as Christians distinctive. Our sense of belonging is rooted in a concept of grace. And it's critical because kids need to be known before they can even feel welcome. Kids need to be known before they can be forgiven. And kids need to be known before they feel like they belong. So whether it's your own child or a child that you're leading, it's so important that they know no matter what they do, no matter what they've done or what they'll do in the future, that they always have a seat at the table. So time, love, words, stories, tribes. And the last one is simple. It's fun. And when we give kids fun over time, we give them connection. Fun makes friendship go deeper. And fun is one of the best ways for us to connect with kids and students. So those are the six things. Time, love, words, stories, tribes, and fun. And whether you have 900 marbles left or you have 45, every one of them is precious and every moment matters. And you know, for some of you, you might be on that, that lower end of the spectrum. And I want you to hear today that it's not too late. You know, we could stand up here and say, make every minute count. First of all, that's impossible. And second of all, that is way too much pressure. But I think all of us, can make every week matter. And if you're a parent, what I think the best news is today is that you don't have to do that alone. Like Scott was talking about, you have a community. And you know, it might seem like you're doing this by yourself, but when you look around and see these leaders who are ready to step up and lead with you, they wanna partner with you, and you are the number one influencer on your child's spiritual growth. And if you do these six things and you do them well over time, you're gonna make an impact. There's also people raising their hand and saying, I'm going to walk one of these seasons with you. There might be a worker in the nursery who looks at your 14-month-old and says, yeah, I know you're tired, and I know it's hard. And yeah, your kid definitely does scream for 30 minutes when you leave the nursery. But I'm going to love them with you for this next season of their life so that when they grow up, they know that in Christ they're worth something. And then there's a leader of, of fourth and fifth graders that says, see these 80 marbles over here? I'm going to walk these with you, and I'm going to tell your kids incredible stories over time so that they believe that God's word is true and that they are a part of his story of redemption. Every week, we have leaders show up. 
And it's not because their jobs are easy. It's certainly not because their jobs are easy. And sometimes they're not even fun or rewarding. But they believe to their core that over time, if they keep showing up, that they can show a child what it looks like to follow Jesus. This last week, I was talking to one of our incredible high school leaders, and she's made a really substantial investment. She's invested 180 marbles. Four years ago, she invested a season of her life into a group of freshman girls. And she said for their four years of high school, that she was going to walk through it with them. Four years, some of the most critical years of these girls' lives. Because she believed that for the long haul, over time, by God's grace, she could really make an impact. You know, when she started, most of these girls weren't actively following Jesus. And they had little worth and little direction. But she created a place for them to belong. She told them they had a seat at the table. And she loved them well over time. And together, they've navigated some really difficult and tumultuous waters of poor choices and horrible life circumstances. And if we had the time, man, these stories would blow you away. But they're also high school girls, so they've had a lot of fun. They've baked cookies and hung out and looked at prom dresses. And today, as they get ready to graduate from high school, they are all actively following Jesus and find their worth in him. They know that they're royal and chosen. Nearly all of them have been baptized. They are entering the world, disciples, ready to make disciple makers. And it wasn't because of some big event or thing in their life, but it was because someone gave them a place to belong and made an investment of time. So as parents and as leaders, we need to count our marbles because we're losing them either way. So we might as well play for keeps. And what you do this week for a child, whether it's your own child or somebody else's, it matters, and it matters even more over time. That was so well said. You know, for years, I, I, I run into kids that are now in their 20s and 30s that, 30s that were involved in, or active in, in one of the student ministries that I was blessed to lead. And sometimes they'll say something to me like this. Man, those were some of the best times I ever had. Do, do you remember that retreat we went on? Do you remember that meeting? Do you remember when we did this? And some of these kids at that time, they were going through some extremely difficult situations. Some of them had some home lives that were incredibly challenging. Some of them were making some very unwise decisions. And we're suffering the consequences. Yet, the community that they formed saw them through that season of life. You know, folks, I think there's three groups, broadly speaking, wherever you're participating today in, in your room. There's a group that, that some of you are very connected to Northway or to a church. Meaning you are attending, you are learning, you are serving, you are giving. You are deeply involved. And first, I want to say thank you. Because you're really what makes this church go. However, my guess, if I were to ask you, life is still coming at you fast, right? I mean, you're, you're facing difficult situations. You maybe made some unwise decision. And now I'm not positive. But I think that if you... face those as being part of the local church, if you're grounded in a local church that right now, no matter how difficult things have gotten, you're not beaten down, you're not exhausted, and you're not without hope. I think there's probably a second group in this room that, that maybe you're on the edges. You know, you have one foot in, one foot out. You attend from time to time. You get involved occasionally. And life is still coming at you fast, right? Difficult situations. How are you doing? Do you feel chosen, royal, holy, a possession of God? See, see being a Christian on your own is never the way it was meant to be. And then there's a third group. Some of you maybe haven't been to church since youth group. Or maybe you haven't been here since last Mother's Day when your mom made you come with you, right? How's it going out there? No. 
that we do not have it all together in here. I am just a kid from Munhall that is submitted to God's authority and trying to lead a community of Jesus' disciples. We offer ministry and programs, and I hope we offer hope and love in the name of Jesus. So if that third group descri describes you, please know this. You are welcome here. And please come as you are. Th this section of 1 Peter, it ends with this. Verse 10, once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. I'm going to ask your campus pastor or leader, wherever you're participating, to come on up and close your service in prayer. Why don't everybody stand with me now?